Hey folks, welcome to another edition of Inside the Marvel Palace, where we're not, and we won't be for a while yet by the looks of things, because COVID restrictions have been expanded for another month. Uh, I am Murray Mandrick. I am the political columnist for Leader Post and Star Phoenix. Joining me as per usual, Arthur White Crummy, our, our political reporter with the uh, newspapers, and a young lady who spent a ridiculous amount of time inside the Marble Palace lately doing uh, the press conference, Lynn Giesbrick. Thanks for joining us, Lynn. Yeah, it's good to be here for the first time. That's great. Yeah, it, it's we're, it, it, if for those who've been paying attention, we do shift off. Uh, the various reporters come, come covering our conferences, uh, and the best thing about it is we get a tremendous knowledge base in terms of uh, understanding the COVID thing and hopefully bringing you information. Lots to talk about this week. Let's start out with the fact that everything's the same as, as, as it's always been, Arthur. <laughs> Although, you know, in fairness, a week ago, we were talking about the problem with vaccines, perhaps Premier uh, Premier Scott Moe leaning too heavily into vaccines, perhaps not finding the right mix, perhaps not doing the right thing uh, and uh, thinking about maybe uh, opening up restrictions. He didn't do that. Uh, in some ways, he's probably not getting enough credit for that from the people who are inclined not to give him enough credit. Uh, but I don't think he's actually appeased the people that want a opening of Saskatchewan uh, in uh, a more, as the premier says, fulsome way. Uh, what do you think he hit the, the the sweet spot, Arthur, in terms of just carrying on with what we have until March 19th? And maybe just for a second, remind people what we have in case they've somehow magically forgotten. Yeah, we continue to have the exact uh, same the the exact same public health measures that we've been dealing with since uh, December. So we have capacity restrictions on retail, but uh, not extremely, uh, you know, restrictive compared to other provinces in that regard. We're still having uh, very restrictive measures in terms of bubbles. Uh, you're limited to uh, your, your five person bubble. None of that has changed. Uh, that's been extended until uh, March 19th. And uh, as far as hitting the sweet spot, I mean, it really depends on who you ask, but it's clear that the premier is still carrying on with his emphasis on balance. Uh, and and uh, I don't really think that we saw any surprises there because uh, just last week we had already gotten a strong signal from the premier that he wasn't planning anything drastic, that so long as cases uh, are on this steady but slow downward trajectory, that we're probably not going to see him mess with a recipe that he believes is working. Well, I'm a little surprised in that sense because I'm not so sure the recipe is completely working yet or I'm not completely buying in uh, to the massive reduction in cases because we're still seeing positivity rates that are hovering around 10%. Some days they have uh, slipped a little bit below that. Some days even close to 5% positivity in terms of the percentage of people tested that have COVID. Uh, we are seeing overall numbers go down, but once again, that really depends on testing. And testing is often determined by what the weather's like outside and whether people actually have been circulating, actually feel like going out and testing. I think this is all part of the fatigue that we're seeing right now. And I guess I'll ask you, Lynn, is there a sense that you're getting from feedback and the stories that you're doing and otherwise that that COVID fatigue as we approach a year uh, uh, pretty soon within a matter of weeks is really starting to set into people? Are, are you sensing a little bit more of that whenever you have to do a story and people uh, say, oh, my God, you're bringing up COVID again? Uh, <laughs> I'm sick and tired of talking about COVID. Um, yeah, some, although I think it's worth noting it's not new. I don't think yeah. now is when COVID fatigue is setting in. I think it started setting in, um, at Christmas was when I noticed the frustration really increased. And then ever since Christmas, I think people are just been tired of this. Um, I think it's worth noting on the testing though. I haven't seen testing numbers significantly drop over the last few days, even as we've had lower numbers. So I think that's a good sign. Um, yeah. but with like fatigue and stuff, I think, as much as people are kind of sick of having restrictions, there's almost a sense of relief that restrictions have been extended to just because it's the same. Like there's a sense of consistency now. People aren't having to rethink plans once again or what they have going on right now is just like staying the same. And I think people are thankful for that even 
even if they would like to see the restrictions. I, I was wondering about that because there is a little bit of a sense of comfort and maybe relief that he didn't go a little further in terms of opening up uh, the place. And I, uh, you know, to your point, Arthur, I guess that's kind of what I thought he might do: just find something, uh, uh, throw them, throw the public a bone someplace along the line. Uh, particularly when uh, they tout the numbers being uh, successful. There's been a lot of talk of late I found online about whether or not our numbers are as successful. Uh, as the Premier purports them to be. And I'm kind of curious about that. Uh, if you look at where we are right now, we are kind of catching up to Alberta. Uh, we're not quite catching up to Manitoba in terms of per capita deaths, but on a daily basis, because we tend to be in the upper echelons in our per capita numbers, be they active cases, be they new cases, and sadly daily death counts, um, we have kind of wrapped up. Is, has that been sort of one measuring stick of the government, uh, you think, Arthur, that probably caused them not to go any further than they obviously uh, uh, did on uh, on Tuesday? I've always gotten the sense that their primary measuring stick is hospitalizations and the, uh, the integrity of the health system. So long as the health system is not threatened, we're not going to see them do anything drastic to the economy. And uh, we've seen hospitalizations on a very slow downward tra uh, downward trajectory uh, over the past several weeks since I think about mid January. Uh, don't don't forget that deaths are the most lagging indicator. Often people are going. If you see an upward trend in cases, you're going to see an upward trend in deaths for several weeks following. So I'm not sure that that's the main thing that the government is going to be looking at as they decide what to do with restrictions and whether their current set of restrictions is working. Now, uh, I think you're right that in many ways, uh, our data is showing that we continue to do worse than other provinces. Uh, we're still number one in terms of active cases per capita and still number one in terms of new seven, the uh, seven day average of new cases per capita. But again, I, I just feel that so long as the health system is protected, and so long as those trends are going in the right direction, we're not going to see any strengthening of of, uh, of the uh, you know public health measures. Uh, and we got a signal from Premier Mo that the first thing that they may be considering uh, in a month's time is loosening up some of the restrictions on household bubbles. So that could be coming on March 19th if we continue to follow this trend. I think that'll be the first thing, Lynn. What is your sense in terms of different places in the province reacting differently? Because to be quite frank, uh, I don't get out that much, partly because no one likes me, but uh, partly because uh, we everybody's living by these restrictions. But the restrictions that people are living in in different parts of the province, the conversations I have when I talk to people at, at, at different parts of the province is, why are we doing this? I don't know anybody in my area that has COVID anymore, or that's a, a city problem, or that's a northern problem. Um, the problem I think the Premier has had is sort of selling the notion that we are all in this together, and partly because I don't th know if he's necessarily messaged that right, but is it realistic to think that part of the problem is the fact that there still remains that level of variance. Right now in the south in Saskatchewan, we're just not seeing as many cases as we were earlier. And it, it seems to be uh, the cities and a northern belt basically stretching all the way from uh, Lloyd Minster to, to Nipawin across the province in which we see more cases. Is, is there that much variant that people kind of react in different ways? I think so. Um... But I think we've kind of seen that happen throughout the pandemic, too, like especially at the beginning, right, when COVID was such a new thing. Um, you really only noticed people taking measures seriously in places that were having high outbreaks or a lot of cases that people were hearing about and getting scared. And they were like, oh, OK, measures, we need to do this. Um, and I think it's, and that gets back to the fatigue thing, too. Yeah, like I think gone through it become more normal. But I think it has taken the rural communities, especially quite a while um, to feel like it's hitting them, too. Um, and I think now it's just normal, like people are fine wearing masks and stuff like that. We're seeing less pushback on that. But um, yeah, I think there is definitely some differences in, in feeling in rural communities. And um, but at the same time, like less of their um, like social lives have probably been impacted than in the cities, too, because in a sense, we had more to lose to begin with in that in that realm. It 
let's talk about the different reactions in terms of where you come from, from an occupational standpoint and everything else, because this directly results uh, in the conversation related to vaccines or, or produces sort of the conversation uh, related to vaccines. We see a lot of, of different groups, Lynn, uh, of people now claiming um, uh, that they need to be further up in line uh, in terms of the vac vaccination. And uh, you wrote a story, uh, and uh, we're at the press conference last week, when health workers were really raising that issue uh, in a predominant way. Seems to be a really good argument that health uh, uh, health uh, workers should be at the front of the line because they they risk the most exposures. What were they told initially about getting vaccines in phase one and maybe early phase two? And why are they so collectively frustrated uh, right now with the government's decision uh, to basically make it age-based and start with the, the 60 plus uh, category is the predominant voice of phase two? And uh, I guess generally, why do you think the, uh, the premier uh, reacted and decided maybe to take a second look at this and change uh, uh, change things. Was it because of, of in your mind, the reaction that they were getting from the health community? Yeah, so initially uh, in mid-January, the SHA did a town hall with their physicians and they the plan they had at the moment was that all healthcare workers, it didn't matter what kind of position you had, um, would get a COVID vaccine ahead of the general population. And then in the vaccine plan that was released to the public last Tuesday, that had changed completely and there were only a handful of positions left uh, in that priority group and everyone else was just getting lumped into their age group. Um, so there was a big backlash from healthcare workers, obviously, and I think maybe part of it was just because they felt they had that promise and then it was taken away. Um, but yeah, like you said, they have more um, potential for contact with COVID than uh, I do for sure working from home. Um, so yeah, then Mo or Premier Mo uh, at the press conference said the Ministry of Health was considering taking a second look at that, which they did, and now they've added more. Um, so I think some of that was just pushback, but um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe they felt that was a preliminary plan anyway, and they were thinking of considering it even before. Um, it's hard to know for sure what exactly tipped that decision, but it feels like they've really been trying to, to uh, in the balance of do we go for speed in vaccinations or do we go for priority populations? They've been heavily leaning towards speed. Um, so this seemed like a small walk back in that, uh, in that focus, but um, they're still, I would say, focusing much more on just speed of delivery to everyone than on priority population. Hey, I, I think so. And I think that's the one aspect of strategies related to COVID uh, that uh, I believe personally the, the the Premier and the Health Ministry and, and the SHA deserve strong marks for uh, because they haven't been swayed over, over their record. And you have to really appreciate how much pressure internally and otherwise there probably was when you have health workers telling other health decision makers that, hey, remember where we came from. This is, uh, this is our priority too. Is there a political element to this, Arthur, in, in, in your opinion or from what you, you've seen? Because the opposition certainly raised that prospect that uh, initially that uh, what I think uh, opposition leader Ryan Miley suggested is that the 60 plus crowd happens to be SAS party voters. I don't know if that necessarily <laughs> uh, uh, bears out, actually, but but it, it certainly was something that uh, uh, w was stated and, and uh, I think quickly rebuked. Uh, is, was there in some sense uh, a political notion to this or did in this particular case from what they've described make a pretty good compelling argument that they were sticking to the science in this particular decision? Well, <laughs> it, it's it's both at the same time. I mean, it's impossible to dispute that that vaccine distribution is now the number one political issue in the province, probably replacing case numbers, and is going to be until this is over. Uh, and, and and it's essentially uh, a zero sum game. Uh, and a, a, every vaccine that's given to a uh, priority group uh, is a vaccine that can't go to somebody in that 60 plus age category. Uh, and Premier Mo was very clear uh, that, uh, that 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 adding all of these additional health workers uh, that, that that are now in phase one could push back uh, the beginning of phase two for several 
more weeks uh, if we don't start getting vaccines a lot more quickly from the federal government. So uh, it's, this is a classic distributional issue where, 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 where one group is essentially uh, played off against you know, every other group. Uh, we can't all have the vaccine at the same time. That being said, I think that there is a strong argument for the age-based uh, system, the age-based framework. Uh, we, we, we've heard repeatedly that that's the main sense in which mortality is correlated, correlated strongly with age more than any other factor. Uh, so the argument is strong, and that's the argument the SAS party has repeatedly made. Your right win speed is the other argument that they're making. And I think that the uh, the uh, provincial government got a little bit panicky when uh, back a couple months ago, we were last in the country or one of the last in the country in terms of how quickly we were distributing the vaccines that were uh, given to us. And they made very quick changes. Uh, and now we're number one, except for. Yeah, PDI. and that's a great point. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, so, I'm really quite amazed by that, that they've actually made up that much ground. Uh, that much more quickly. Arthur uh, says, Lynn, that this will be the ongoing issue at the time. Do you see this issue having legs? Do you see it as an issue that uh, it's just not going to be easily resolved simply because of uh, of an issue that's pretty much out of the province's control uh, in terms of flow of vaccine? Obviously, the premier has talked about uh, uh, buying a vaccine independently, as the Manitoba is attempting to do. But Manitoba, we should note, is little ways away from being able to successfully do that at this particular point. Uh, will vaccine, as Arthur said, become the new political issue or the new issue in terms of, of what we'll be talking about in the COVID fight, you think? Sorry, was that a question for me? Yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, it was for you, Lynn. I apologize. Okay. Um, yes, I, I, I think it will be the ongoing thing because um, that's the light at the end of the tunnel and everyone just wants hope at this point. So... Um, yeah, we can pay attention to case numbers and deaths, and obviously people are still watching those, but vaccines are definitely top of mind for everyone, and I think everyone's just like, when will I get in? When's, when's my turn in the queue? Um, yeah, so that's definitely where public focus will be, I think. And, and to close, like he, the Premier ended on a pretty optimistic note yesterday, saying that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, there's going to be good things happening once the vaccines start to flow and it'll start to flow a little faster. So everybody uh, hang in there. I'll start with you, Arthur. Arthur, do you think that he was being a little bit uh, overly optimistic given some of the missteps in terms of vaccine uh, distribution? Or is that just what you say right now? Because as we've talked about during this podcast, uh, people are getting grumpy and, and getting frustrated yeah. with everything and you have to give them some hope. I, I think it's good, you know, public health messaging and good political messaging, which don't necessarily always go in the same direction, but this time they are. Uh, it, 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 he has to encourage people to stick with this uh, for at least one more month, probably much longer. Uh, and the vaccine is really the uh, the carrot for that. I mean, it's easier to stick with all of these restrictions, to stick with... Uh, uh, this isolation and the depression that sometimes comes with it if you know that it is going to be over. So that's, uh, I think, a good uh, optimism to show in some of these calls. And he was, in a sense, at his most optimistic that I've seen him in weeks. He seems to have gotten a good sense from the federal government that this is going to speed up in the weeks to come. Uh, hopefully that does pan out. We might be seeing 5,000 vaccinations by April, he was signaling. So if that starts to happen, then I think it's going to be a lot easier for people uh, to stick with the restrictions going forward. You think so too, Lynn? That seems to be the focus, wanting to make it all about the vaccines and everything else. Uh, he has to make a tough decision in another month right now if the numbers continue on. But is this the right course right now in terms of having it just one more month and then reassessing at this particular time in terms of at least... Uh, placating uh, a public out there that's going to be growing increasingly frustration. Hopefully the weather will improve and they'll have less reason to be grumpy. But uh, uh, do, you, do you think that, that, that that's probably the right call in terms of time lengths and, 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 and parsing out little bits of good news as best you possibly can in this particular way? I don't know if I can say whether it's the right call or not. I don't think I have the information yeah, base yeah. to make that call. But yeah. I think it is. it was not unexpected. I don't think I've talked to anyone who was really surprised to see those restrictions extended. Um, and yeah, I think with the vaccine coming, if we see really 
low numbers of vaccines rolling out over the next month, I think people will start to lose that optimism. I think now vaccines are still new enough that people have hope in it. Um, and we have seen those vaccine numbers go up significantly. Like it is getting rolled out pretty quickly for those priority populations right now. Um, so yeah, I think there is still that optimism that, okay, if we stick with this, we can see this through to the finish line and do it well. Um, if this month goes poorly for vaccines, I think that would, we would start to see that change. So I think it's really, this might be the tipping point one way or the other. That might be the, where the sweet spot is. It's, it's sort of the combination of seeing the numbers go down and seeing enough vaccines roll out as the Premier uh, optimistically offered on uh, Tuesday rather quickly or, or, or in, a, in a more speedy way than they have been. Uh, I guess that's about all the time we have this week. Thanks so much. There's a lot to cover, obviously. There seems to be a lot to cover every week. So uh, thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Lynn. And uh, uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again on Inside the Marble Palace. Take care, guys. See you. Thanks for having us.